Without further ado, I want to introduce our featured speaker tonight. She is one of the top immigration attorneys in Silicon Valley. She's very knowledgeable. She's passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. She's a very nice person. It's here for us, Sophie Alcorn. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rob. Hi, everybody. My name is Sophie, and I'm the founder and owner of Alcorn Immigration Law, which is in Mountain View. And my team and I are about helping highly motivated people who happen to have been born in countries that are not the United States of America find ways, so strategies, creative solutions for getting green cards and visas so that you can come to Silicon Valley, live here, build amazing companies, and create the lives that you dream about for yourselves and your families. So uh, it's a real pleasure to be here. And thank you to Rob and Idea to IPO for having me. I love meeting entrepreneurs. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. And I have so much respect and admiration for the courage and determination and perseverance that it takes for somebody from another country to uproot yourselves, leave your home, leave your family move to this strange place and decide, you know, I'm going to make something here. I'm going to create something. And so working with people who have that energy is, is really inspirational to me. And it's one of the reasons why I love practicing immigration law. So this is me. Um, I'm on various social media channels. So you're welcome to follow me. Um, a little bit about myself. I am, I'm the product of immigration. My dad um, was an immigration lawyer, and my mom was his client from Germany. So I'm a dual citizen of the United States and Germany. And I understand what it means to straddle two different cultures and languages. Um, and so you know, I've grown up my whole life seeing immigrants and how my dad helped them. And it was so inspirational to me to hear those stories as a child. And immigration law, immigration law totally sucks. It's one of the most complicated types of law in the United States. It is more complicated than tax law. Who has to deal with it? People who don't speak English. It's not fair at all. It's super complicated. So this is just a quote from a really esteemed federal judge in a case. I'll read it to you. Immigration laws bear a striking resemblance to King Minos's labyrinth in ancient Crete. The tax laws and the Immigration and Nationality Acts are examples we have cited of Congress's ingenuity in passing statutes certain to accelerate the aging process of judges. So even brilliant, esteemed, distinguished federal judges get irked when they have to deal with immigration law because it's so complicated. Um, that being said, you know, it is, if, if there's any message that I want you to leave with from tonight, it's that with enough creativity and strategic thinking and, individual, and um, ingenuity and possibly some sacrifice, it is possible to find a way eventually to live here and work here legally. Um, but it's hard. Um, and as I know a lot of you are startup founders, and so you have an extra motivation to get this squared away, which is that your investors want to know that you have legal immigration status. Because why are they going to fork over you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars to you and your company if what's uncovered in the due diligence is you can only be here for four more months, and then you have to leave? So I understand there's a lot of motivation um, to figure this out. So with that, I want to give you some information about some background and some vocabulary that I find is really helpful to my clients when they get it. Because 
if these concepts aren't, they're not, they're not super complicated, but there's just no central place on the internet where all of these things are laid out. So people sort of muddle through them for several years before it all clicks into place. So I'm just going to give you an overview of these key concepts so that you have a map of, of sort of a really big picture of the process so it can all make more sense to you. So this slide shows US consulate and USCIS. There are two different departments of the United States federal government that deal with the immigration laws. One is the US State Department. The US State Department administers the embassies and consulates that are located in different countries all around the world. So for those of you here who are from a foreign country, if you had to go get, let's say, a B1, B2 visa in your passport to come here as a visitor, or an F1 visa to come here as a student, you went to a US consulate You know, somewhere. This example is from Turkey. Um, which has consulates in Ankara and Istanbul. So they're the ones that you go to that actually take your passport, interview you, put the visa in your passport. But when you're in the United States, usually if you want to do something to change your immigration status, it's not going to have anything to do with the US consulate in the State Department. When you're on US soil and you want to change something, you're dealing with the US Department of Homeland Security, an entirely different federal agency. And the subcomponent of that is USCIS, which stands for US Citizenship and Immigration Services. And they're the part of the federal government domestically that is charged with giving benefits to people, changing people's status, giving people green cards when they're already here in the United States. So, Wanted to lay that out for you first. Now, another, another layer in this labyrinth is sort of the different stages of the process. Now, this looks like a nice, clean little thing. Like you start out as a non immigrant, then you become a permanent resident, then eventually you become a citizen. Um, it doesn't always work that way for everybody. This is really an oversimplification. Um, but what I can tell you is that you're never going to become a citizen unless you're a permanent resident first. So that is required to, if you, to be a permanent resident if you want to become a citizen. And to become, but to become a permanent resident, which is the same thing as having a green card, which is the same thing as having an immigrant visa, which you can get through adjustment of status, um, you don't necessarily have to be a non-immigrant with a J visa or an F visa or a B1, B2 visa or an E2 visa first. There's an alphabet soup of visas. Those are the non-immigrant visas. Those are all to come here temporarily for a specific purpose, for a limited duration. And usually when you get one of those from the foreign consulate, you got to prove, I'm not going to move to the US. I'm not going to live there forever. I'm definitely going back to my home country. This is just temporary. I'm not planning to live in the United States. They, they grill people on that because these are all non-immigrant. And intent, that means you're going to be a permanent resident. You want to live here forever. If you have non-immigrant intent, that means you're coming for a specific duration and for a specific purpose. So if you come to the United States as a non-immigrant, there's usually um, people who are visiting either are from a, a particular set of countries that allow you to come for 90 days without a visa on the visa waiver program through ESTA. And if you do that, you have to leave at the end of the 90 days. Unless, unbeknownst to you, when you planned your trip and embarked on it and entered, you happen to fall in love with a US citizen who you then, at the end of your trip, decide to marry, and you then try to stay here. 
But barring true love, you have to leave at the end of 90 days, and you cannot change your status from the visa waiver program to any other status. You gotta leave, go get another visa, and then come back. If, however, you came on a B1, B2 visitor visa, and you wanna change to another status in the United States, that's cool. You can do that. There's a different set of rules. So to do that, that's called a change of status, and that goes through US citizenship and immigration services in the United States. So going from one non-immigrant classification to another in the United States is a change of status. Now, what happens when you're in the United States and you wanna go from a non-immigrant status to becoming a permanent resident? That's called an adjustment of status, and that's where you apply for a green card inside the United States. Lots of terminology, super confusing, <laughs> not fair, but I'm just trying to lay it out for you so that you know this now so that you aren't like hitting your head against your computer for the next five years seeing all these terms and being like, what the heck am I supposed to do here? So, so my focus is on, on helping um, people in the startup world. So founders, really talented individuals, investors. That's what we're going to be focusing on for tonight's talk. But I just want you to understand the context. That is actually a very small portion of immigration law. Immigration law also deals with asylum if you have persecution that you're fearing from your home country. Um, it also deals with deportation for people who are out of status or who have committed crimes and are trying to figure out whether they're gonna be deported or you know, whether they can get permission to stay from an immigration judge. Um, really important areas, but my focus being in Mountain View is helping highly motivated foreigners get these affirmative statuses to start companies and to use your professional skills in the United States. So I provided everybody with a handout and that is loosely correlated with the slide deck. It's a little bit different, um, but that covers all of the things that I'm now gonna be talking about and I'm also happy to field questions about it in the Q&A later. So, <laughs> I put this at the beginning because it's the most depressing, so we'll just get it over with. <laughs> um, if you have money, there's more options, right? Money is power. Money buys you opportunities. <laughs> so, so there's... There's kind of um, two different investor type statuses. Um, one is the E2 visa, which is a temporary non-immigrant status. And the other is the EB5 green card, which is a permanent residence status. So if you're a startup founder and you're broke, you should still pay attention because what if there's a really nice angel investor who's willing to write you a personal check for $100,000. Maybe you'll qualify for an E2 visa if you're from the right country. So I'll tell you a little bit about the E2. Um, you have to be from a country that has a treaty of commerce and navigation with the United States. If you Google E2 treaty countries, you'll find the list. Important to note, India and China are not on that list, but countries like um, Germany, Italy, Japan, United Kingdom, Turkey, uh, strangely, Iran, they, they have a treaty of commerce and navigation with the United States, and it's possible for somebody to get an investor visa through that. <laughs> So, so, so I advise that if you're going to do this, you probably need at least $100,000 to do it. But that is flexible. There's no 
bright line minimum. Uh, what the State Department looks at for these, because for an E2, you have to go do this at a consulate. It doesn't really work as well in the United States. Uh, so you need a business plan. You need to have already incorporated your company. You need to show that you personally have possession of this money and that you didn't get it through some illegal subterfuge um, scheme. They want to trace the money and where it came from. But basically, you show, look, I'm going to invest my money. I'm going to start a, a business. It's going to be profitable. It's not just to eke out a couple thousand dollars a month for myself and my family. It's to create jobs. It's to have profits. And uh, you, you put together this, we put together this big, thick binder with all of the papers. And then uh, you can get an E2 visa which is cool. I mean, sometimes it can be valid for up to five years in your passport. You can stay for two years at a time. And you get to be in charge of your company and run it and start it and grow it. And then whatever country you're from that you're using for this, other citizens of this country are also allowed to get E2 visas to come work for you. So if you've got friends back home who want to be part of your company and you qualify for this visa and you get one, they can come if they have essential skills that your company needs. So that's a good option to get your friends over here. So the other, let me see here. Oh yeah, it has to be a real company. You can't just make some sham company. That's not going to fly. Uh, yeah, so, that, so that's the E2. So. The corollary, the counterpart for permanent residents is called an EB-5 green card. And this is uh, similar, but has a lot of important differences. So if you think that one day you want to pivot and harness your investment that you've done for the E-2 to get a green card out of it, through the EB-5 program, you should be aware of that at the beginning so that we can lay the foundation properly for both types of statuses. Uh, the EB-5 green card, I'll tell you the original version, and I'll tell you the two variations. So the original version is invest $1 million in, an, in a company in the United States and use that money to create 10 new jobs for American workers. So that's, that's how it started. And then in the early 90s, the Congress introduced some variations. So one variation is we want to encourage job growth in rural areas and also um, urban areas that don't have enough jobs. So if you locate your company in one of those types of places, we're going to lower the investment amount. It's, all, it's half. It's 500K. So you still have to create 10 jobs, but half the investment. So then uh, Congress took another step and created another variation in the 90s, which is still going on, um, though the current, well, I'll touch on this later. The current status is sort of up in the air. This is called the EB-5 Regional Center. So this might not apply to you guys because you're all probably super motivated and interested in business. But if you wanted to be a passive investor and just drop your money into something and not have to deal with it and let somebody else create the jobs and run the development projects. You can just invest $500,000. A regional center will use it to create 10 jobs um, in the region indirectly through your investment. And eventually, you can get a green card out of it. Now, there's been a lot of uh, demand for the EB-5 program, especially from China. So now there's a Chinese backlog, and Chinese people have to wait extra time to get one of these types of green cards. But just in general, it's a long process. It takes 18 months to get your first investment-based green card. 
and then it's only valid for two years. It's conditional. At the end of the two years, you have to prove that you really invested the money and you really created the 10 jobs. And if you go through that, you become a full-fledged permanent resident at the end of it. So the EB-5 program, the regional center thing, is set to expire this September next month in 2016 for the video. Um, it's unknown what Congress is going to do about it. Speculation in immigration lawyer circles is that the whole program is probably going to sunset and lapse, and Congress will sort of drag their heels for a couple weeks, but hopefully reauthorize the program sometime in fall. And it's predicted that the minimum investment levels will be increasing. So the regional center and the targeted, the, the rural slash unemployment area, it's called the targeted employment area program, might have the investment levels increase to 800,000. And the normal EB-5 where you previously put in your million dollars and hired your 10 employees and run your own company, that might increase to $1.2 million. So if you think about those, you know, those amounts, a million dollars meant something way different in 1991 than it does now in, in 2016. So that kind of makes sense. So, OK. But now we're going to move on from the money. And now we're going to talk about what if you already own your own company in another country. Lots of options. Are you going to take questions now? No. So I'm going to continue going through the um, presentation. And then probably in about 15 or 20 minutes, we'll just do Q&A throughout the end. OK. So OK. If you own a company in a foreign country, or even if you've just worked at a company in a foreign country for at least one year out of the last three years, and that company has a relationship with a US company, it might be possible for you to get an L1A visa or an L1B visa to transfer from the foreign branch of the company to the United States branch of the company. Additionally, after that, if you are an executive or manager in the United States, it's also possible for you to get a green card in the United States just through having that company be your employment sponsor. So the types of relationships that qualify between the two companies are parent and subsidiary and also affiliate. So there has to be some sort of common ownership. So let's just pick um, India, for example. So either the Chinese, the, the Indian company can be the parent company, and it can open a subsidiary in Silicon Valley. And if you worked for the Indian company for one year out of the last three years, you can come here to start the new Silicon Valley branch of the Indian company. Or it could be a Silicon Valley a company that's the parent and opening a subsidiary in the foreign country. Either direction works. Or if you just want to personally own at least 51% of both companies, that's also enough to show that they have common ownership and control. So it's a really, I think it's a really great option. First of all, you can use it for a US company that's just barely getting started. You can do it with a startup. If you just have the articles of incorporation and a lease and a business plan and enough cash in the bank to sort of get it going for a little while, there's no like hardline amounts of cash that are necessary for this, um, then you could qualify. So the initial visa, if it's a brand new company that's less than a year old, you would initially get your L1A status approved for one year. And then at the end of the one year, you would have the option to renew it. Um, otherwise, it could be valid for two or three years. And it can be renewed up to a total of seven years, which is pretty great. And then after the United States company has been doing business for more than one year, you can get a green card. 
and you can, you, it's, it's a great type of green card because it's in the, it's called EB1C, and the EB means employment-based, and the, the number one is significant because it means first preference. And first preference is awesome because it means there's no labor certification. So if your friends work at tech companies and you know Google or whatever is sponsoring them for their green card and they've got a bachelor's degree and they're from India, they might be waiting for like 10 years to get their green card. First of all, there's a huge backlog for certain countries. And secondly, you have to go through this process called PERM and the whole point is that the employer who's sponsoring this person has to, in good faith, try to recruit qualified Americans to do the job instead of this foreigner, which is this whole dance with the Department of Labor. And that can you know, easily take six, nine months, a year plus if there's an audit. So the beauty of this EB1C category for international managers and executives, you get to just skip the whole term labor certification process. You just go straight to the petition, there's premium processing, that can take two weeks, boom, you can apply for your green card. People can get that in like six months, which is really beautiful. So something that I recommend to people who uh, are here, they want to have their startup, but there's like really no other option. Um, and if you're running out of time on your current visa, Start a company here, go back to your home country, spend one year there, start a subsidiary in your home country, work there, get your company going, and then one year later, come back here. And then you, you could even come back here straight on a green card if you've managed to keep your United States company going and doing business and getting contracts. I understand from an entrepreneurship standpoint that might be really difficult, but from an immigration standpoint, it could be a great solution if you're willing to sacrifice one year of being gone in order to get a lifetime of being here. So I'm really excited about the L1A visa. Um, I'll, I'll also mention the L1B because I talked about it a little bit. That is for other employees of the company who have specialized knowledge. So if they know about some product or service or aspect of the company in depth, and they've been working at the foreign company for one year out of the last three years, they can get the L1B visa to come here, use that specialized knowledge in the US company, and that status can be valid for five years. But they don't qualify for the fancy EB1C green card. They have to go through the normal process. So. So yeah, so I've, I've talked about the EB1C green card. Also, I should mention for, for all of these, your spouse and your dependent children who are under age 21 can also get visas or green cards to come here with you. So don't worry, they will be covered. Um, I was talking to some members of the audience, though, about the H4, for example. So that's the visa for the spouse of somebody who's here on an H-1B. It's crummy because there's, you have to wait a really long time to get a work permit. Um, but it's good to note that with the L-1A and the E-2 investor visa, for both of those, if you have a spouse, your spouse can get a work permit and your spouse will have the ability to work at any company in the United States. So that can really matter, you know, so they don't have to put their professional identity on hold for many, many years. Okay, great. So we can move on. Next category. So if you don't have money and you don't have a company, what can you do if you have talent? If you're brilliant, if you're extraordinary, now, the biggest problem I find about these types of visas and green cards is that people are too modest and too humble. And they, especially, especially women, um, you know, I, I, sometimes 
foreign women will show me their resumes, and it's like, dude, you could have applied for this years ago. You're totally undervaluing yourself and your talents. Yes, you qualify. Let's just do this. So, so I encourage you to just, you know, take a look at the factors on the USCIS website, or I can share them with you, because you might, you might qualify. So this is the O1A visa or status for a person of extraordinary ability, and the sort of equivalent EB1A green card for somebody with extraordinary ability. And they're similar, but they're slightly different. The categories of evidence do not completely overlap between the two. So it's important to just look at both from the beginning to figure that out. OK, drawback of the O1A visa, spouse cannot work. So that's something to consider. But just to give you an idea of some of these factors for the O1A. So, OK, if you've won a Nobel Prize, you're in. You can come. Just stop. You don't have to go through the rest of it. But otherwise, if you've won any national or international prizes in your field, that counts. Now, there's, you only need three of these categories. If you have three, if you have evidence that's like solid in three of these categories, you're good. OK, so prizes. Next, basically, are you in any organizations that are just for experts? Like, have you proven to some organization, some academy, some uh, highly ranked group that you are special enough to be in their organization? If you're, you know, if you're in IEEE or some other professional organization where you just pay for 40 bucks a year, that's not going to count. But if, if you had to be invited or apply, we could look at that. Another factor is. Are there any newspaper articles written about you or articles in professional trade journals? And this could be about you. This could be about your work. And uh, the more articles, the better. You can use any. They can be online. They could be TechCrunch. Um, you could hire a media consultant to help position your company well. I mean, there's. You can think creatively about this. And maybe you know, what's good for your startup marketing efforts could also be good for this O1A visa application. Another one of the factors that USCIS will consider is have you judged the work of other people? So either just by yourself, or have you been on a panel of judges in a jury? But have you decided whether other people should get a prize an award, a PhD, uh, stuff like that counts. So they also consider what you have invented. Do you have any original scientific, scholarly, or business-related contributions of major significance in your field? And so another strategy that immigration lawyers use when thinking about this is, what is your field? Is it computer science? No, that's way too big. Is it you know, some tiny sub-niche of something? Well, maybe that's too small. So we kind of have to find the sweet spot where th that's really emblematic of your research, but also where we can show, like, look, you've done a lot in this niche, and you have experts who are willing to write letters about you and talk about your status in this field. If you've written your own articles and scholarly publications, that, that counts. That's another factor. And then this is sort of in a different vein. But if you've worked for an organization with a distinguished reputation, and you've worked there in a critical or essential capacity, that's another factor that they consider. So important job in an important organization. And then. If you've gotten a really high salary, that's something they also consider for the O1A. So the O1A is super cool. You can just keep renewing it forever. One drawback is that you have to have an employer or an agent sponsor you. 
one of the things that's kind of on the legal cutting edge for O1As is what if you have a corporation that you happen to own that's your employer? And uh, you know, can your own company sponsor you? So that might be possible. It's a bit more gray area, but I'm willing to make the argument and try it because I think there's a legal basis and I think it has the opportunity to work. So if you don't have a company though, what can you do? Well, you could go straight to the green card. You could just try to get an EB1A green card because you are allowed to self-petition for that. It's very similar to the O1A. Um, there's a couple more factors. Some of them specifically have to do with the arts. But the, the EB1A is great, once again, like the, uh, the thing for the managers and the exec executives, the EB1C, because there's no PERM labor certification process. It's fast. You can get premium processing. And it's beautiful because you're not tied, you're not necessarily, if you self-petition, you're not tied to a particular employer. You can just go where the wind takes you across Silicon Valley or the world, or the US, I guess, so. Um, okay, so if you don't meet those criteria, what can you do? What if you're doing really important work but you only have one or two of those factors. How can you get a green card? So there's another option, which is called the EB2 green card, employment-based second preference, and that goes with a national interest waiver. So normally in this EB2 category, as I mentioned before, the employer has to recruit American workers in the PERM process to see if there's anybody else who can do your job. But in this category, you're basically saying it is, in, it is good for America if I, you know, Sophie Alcorn, say your name, personally am here doing this job because my talent and my skills are so unique and my work is in America's national interest. You guys need me, please take me. So it's this other type of green card that's also a really good option for a lot of people. So you have to show that you're working in an area, a professional field of endeavor or something that has intrinsic merit. So probably, um, yeah, so probably if you have some new like marijuana invention that works in states that have legalized pot, um, we're not going to be able to make an argument that it's in America's national interest for you to be doing this. Uh, <laughs> we need it. But, you know, there's, there's other things. Like, if you were Airbnb and you just created a source of income for millions of people across America, yeah, we got a strong argument that what you're doing is in America's national interest. And the benefit has to be for the whole country, not just for one particular geographical area. Or you have to be able to argue that as a lawyer. And then you have to show that you as an individual would be way better at doing it than just some random dude who also has a bachelor's degree like you do or who also has a master's degree like you do. So you have to show you know, why you are so amazing, <laughs> which is intense. It's hard to do. But it's totally possible and really awesome when it works. Um, one drawback, though, about this category is that for countries that have an EB2 wait list, you still have to wait until your visa number is available. So I think for India and for China, this process could take several more years. Um, but if you have another visa in the meantime, then maybe you can wait it out. OK. We're marching along towards the end of the presentation part. But I want you guys, I want you guys to do something for me. So normally, speakers tell you to silence your cell phones and leave them out. But I would actually like you to get out your cell phone right now, please, for a minute. <laughs> get them out. Okay, 
And I want you to open your text messaging app. And I'm going to tell you my office's text message phone number. So you can send me a text. And you can put your name in it, your email, and what type of visa you're interested in. And we can then email you some information about it so you have more than what's just on this handout. So if you want particular details about what is the you know, O1A list of criteria, or what are the specific details for the L1A with the business plan or something, I can get that to you. So the phone number is area code 650-417-3242. So once again, that's 650-417-3803. And include your name and your email and the case type. And we can get that information to you. You can put whatever you're interested in. OK, so then we'll, we'll close with my last section before we do the Q&A. And if there's anything that I can impart to you, it's that <coughs> Where there's creativity, there's opportunity. So if you don't have money, and you don't have a foreign company, and you don't have talent, well, maybe there's still another creative solution that we can find to get you the immigration status and the ability to live and work here that you want. So OK, so first I'll mention the J-1 visa. That can be used for training programs and cultural exchange programs. So if you have an employer here who's hesitant about sponsoring you for an H-1B visa because the lottery is awful and it only happens in April and there's only a 25% chan percent chance of being selected and then you can't even start till the next October and it's so frustrating. Um, you might consider a J-1 exchange program. You can work here for 18 months. You can be paid by the company and you can learn a lot. So. The thing, though, about this is it's cultural exchange. So there are companies that, administ that administer this that your employer could hire to get this for you. Um, but they want to know that you're intending to go back to your home country at the end of this 18 months. There's something called the J-1 two-year foreign residency requirement. If you take government money to sponsor you for a J-1 program, you might get this thing put in your passport that says um, bearer is subject to the 212E foreign two-year foreign residency rule, which means at the end of your status, you have to go home for two years unless you get that waived and you can't stick around. If you don't have it, there could be the possibility that you could get another visa at the end of those 18 months. OK, another option is OPT. I know some of you, because I talked to you at the beginning, some of you have OPT right now. So some people who need to find a way to work um, decide to get another master's degree because maybe you know after the first semester of their program, they'll be eligible for CPT, curricular practical training. And then they can get job experience, which is relevant for their degree, and have a work permit to be able to get that experience in a United States company. Um, if you're not already a student and you're interested possibly in going back to school, if you go to get a bachelor's degree or a master's degree or a PhD. You can get one year of OPT at the end of it, which is optional practical training. It's a work permit. You can have a startup. Um, and then if your degree is in science, technology, education, or math, the STEM fields, you have the option of getting an additional two-year extension. And that's new. It used to be 17 months, but now it's two years. And the question is, can you work for your own startup on STEM OPT? And I think the answer is yes. It's new territory. But I think if you have a company that you own 
that at least has another employee who can sign off on the training plan and commit to training you for your, your STEM OPT extension, I think it's possible to get that approved. Other options that I would like to mention before we run out of time is um, Oh yeah, okay, so there's some H-1B options. If you already have an H-1B, you can transfer to be at your own startup. If you own 50, if you own less than 50% of your company, it's easier. If you own more than 50% of your company, it's harder but still possible. Basically, you have to prove that your company can fire you which sounds ridiculous, but the H-1B visa is for em employees. So you need to be an employee. There's gotta be like a board of directors or other owners who have the ability to fire you so that you are technically an employee of your company. Uh, there's also an organization that I have not worked with directly, but I've heard buzz about, which is called Unshackled. They do H-1B sponsorship. I think the way it works is you already have an H-1B, you want to work for yourself and start your own company, you go to them, you, you, um, you don't pay them, but you uh, maybe like rent office space from them or something, and they employ you, and they sponsor you for an H-1B, and they allow you to work on your startup, which is your own project. Um, there's also something called the Global Entrepreneur in Residence Program, which is currently offered at University of Massachusetts and I think in Colorado. And I, was, I had lunch with the organizer and he was talking about expansions in Alaska and California. The idea here is uh, the H-1B lottery, nobody wants to deal with it. Universities and the Department of Defense don't have to. So if, if you go through this program to be an entrepreneurship mentor, you can get your primary H-1B sponsored by the university. You can work there like one day a week mentoring students in the business school or the computer science program or something. And then you're allowed to get a second concurrent H-1B to work for your own company in addition to that. And wow, you just avoided the H-1B visa lottery. Really awesome. If you um, don't have an H-1B, but you have some funding, I know the guy who runs this program, so if you want to email me, I'd be happy to do an introduction. But they want startups that already have some traction. Um, if you're from Australia, uh, Chile, or Singapore, there's special rules for H-1Bs. There's no lottery. You also get to go around that. If you're Canadian, there's the TN visa, which is for professionals. And then um, another option, which <laughs> is always there, and I, I know that some professionals feel ashamed about using this, but look, if you are truly in love with an American citizen and want to spend the rest of your life with this person, um, you can get a green card in six months. So that's just something that you should know. Okay, so Tinder. that's my talk. <laughs> yeah, Tinder. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. So I would just say don't, do not commit fraud. They will find you. It will be awful. Do not do that. But if you truly are in love with an American, and that could be the answer to this for you, don't be ashamed to use that because you um, are so intent on having your own professional identity be the basis for your immigration status that you're not willing to try that. So that's my talk. I hope I covered lots of good information for you. <laughs> Thank you. And now I'll be happy to answer your questions. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Shankar. Um, I'm on uh, H-1B visa. Uh, if I want to start a company, I can. I know I can uh, register a company, but I'm not sure if I can work for it. Uh, for example, code an app or something like that um, without taking any money from that company. So is it something possible? 
Great question. A very touchy technical legal issue. So you're not allowed to work for any company besides your H-1B sponsor. You're right, you are allowed to own a company. Employment is broadly defined by USCIS, and it is doing anything with an expected, this is not the legal, like, I did not memorize this, but it's basically, uh, if you're doing anything with an expected future monetary gain, they can consider that employment, and it would be unauthorized. So I think it's safer to set up the company legally, negotiate contracts, try to get funding, um, maybe hire another person to develop the app or to start getting the results or the customers or whatever. And then when you have enough money in the bank, maybe to cover your first year's salary, then you could try to petition yourself for an H-1B. Or you could consider a program like Unshackled. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Hi. Okay. Uh, my question is in regards to uh, the EB-5 visa. Yes. Uh, I actually have a couple of questions about it. So firstly, does it have to be your own money that you invest, or can it be like a gift, or can it be an investment from, let's say, an angel investor? OK. My, yeah. OK. It has to be your own money, but you can receive it through as a gift. That's OK. So if an investor wants to, let's say, invest a uh, million dollars and uh, you know, basically be willing to help me out, then is that, would that money be considered as um, my investment? Yeah, so it's gray area, <laughs> borderline, touchy. Question? Um, I, I've, I have not gotten an EB-5 approved like that. I have gotten an E-2 approved like that, where the investor basically just wrote a check to the founder the founder deposited an investor in the would always uh, write a check to the company and not to a single person, right? And that would be foolish. So, so that's not, <laughs> well, see, you have to, then it won't work. You have to personally possess the funds. The other thing is they want to know exactly how that money, the path that that money flowed through to get to you and why you earned it. Um, if it came from your parents, I know it's a different situation, but they would want to know like how your parents earned that money. So they're really concerned about fraud and money laundering and illegal money. Okay, uh, actually, sorry, follow-up question. So uh, let's say you know there is some money in the account, and you know you file an EB-5, and then uh, you know you hire ten employees. First of all, a uh, million dollars in the Bay Area would not give you more than one year uh, <laughs> worth of you know ten employees. Uh, so yeah. uh, I don't know how that works. I mean, how would you suffice that? investment for two years and well how then, do they exactly then you'll have to so you'll have to figure out another business way to you know another way to make that work as a business but it would satisfy the immigration requirements if that money was used to create Does 10 your jobs. company have to be profitable at the end of two years nope you could lose all the money it could even go out of business but you put in the money the 10 jobs were there at one point. Yeah. One point or throughout the two years? Um, during the two years, they existed. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> OK, so if uh, I'm from OPT, I'm going to apply for H1. Okay. But uh, I want to, I have a startup. So my startup is sponsoring me as H1, and I have less uh, than 50% equity. Okay. So does, is, are there any requirements for a company that uh, my company has to be this big, or it can be a just regular startup, or is there yeah. any specifications re regarding that? Yes. So USCIS will look to see if your company has the ability to pay you the prevailing wage. The prevailing wage is based on... Um, like wage labor surveys that the government does. So you have to make a minimum amount for your job position, your job title in the geographical area. Your company has to at least be able to afford to pay you that. So if you can have like one year's salary saved up in your corporate bank account at the beginning, that would be really useful. Um, 
I have gotten H-1Bs for startups approved who haven't had that. There have been requests for evidence where the government wants to know what's your business plan, who, who are your contracts with, do you have any investors? Like they want it because they, they don't want people just making up sham businesses to get visas for their friends. They want to know that it's legitimate. But in those cases, if there's not a lot yet to sh that the company has to show for itself monetarily, um, what sometimes happens is the H-1B could be approved for one year instead of three years, and then you'll have the opportunity to, to grow the business and extend it more later. Thanks. OK, who's next? Hi, my Hi. name is Emna, and before Hi. I ask my question, I want to thank you very much. This was really a great presentation, and I've talked to lawyers before, so I can tell everybody who didn't, she really knows the hell what she's doing. Thank so you. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, and thank you, Idea to IPO, for recording this as well, because I'm already thinking how I'm going to share this with the oh. founders I'm helping, because I'm a startup coach. But great. Um, so my question is concerning the L1 visa. Two questions, actually. So if you have already the two years restriction, like mm -hmm. you came on J1, then you came on F1. Mm -hmm. So, and I know it's cumulative, mm -hmm. right? It's not two years at a time. Like there are certain visas you're not eligible for. So is L1 one of them yes. or you still can be eligible for L1? I believe the L1 you're not eligible. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so for the L1 visa, you said um, if somebody owns a company in, in your country, let's say, um, but what if you own a company in your country, you're the CEO of it, mm -hmm. you know, legally on papers, but you're not there but you're running it from here and you're back and forth. Does that still count that one year? Okay, so you have to be physically outside of the United States yeah. okay. for one year working for the company within the three-year period. You can add up different periods of time. You can't count the time when you're in the United States. Even if like all the paperwork is under your name, you're signing everything. Yeah, you anytime you're in the United, United States, States, it stops the clock but it does not restart the clock. So you can add up the chunks of time between the US trips together to get to one year within okay. the time period. And one other question yeah. about another type of visa for the O-1 visa. I know most people think you know you gotta be an artist or anything like that, but today we see new technologies like exponential technologies like VR and AR. And oh yeah, so totally like usable for tech. Okay, yes. so yes. you can apply O-1 of showing. Absolutely. Okay, yeah. cool, thank cool. you. Oh, thank you. Great. Hi. Hello. Yeah, it's fine. It doesn't amplify it. Just okay, speak okay. into it. Well, uh, my question is regarding the J-1 visa, two-year home residency requirement. Uh, for example, in my case, it was uh, funding from the Spanish government. So the two-year home residency is regards Spain. Mm -hmm. So I have to be the two-year in Spain, or it can be in another country, for example, one year in Spain and one year in Switzerland, or it has to be mandatory uh, in Spain? I think technically it has to be outside of the United States. I mean, the spirit of the law is that you're going to go bring your knowledge back to Spain. But um, it's totally possible to get your two-year foreign residency requirement waived. So we can get a waiver based on getting a no objection statement from the Spanish government. Um, there are other, other possible types of waivers as well. If you're working for a US government agency, there is another type of waiver, which is um, you know, based on it being in the national interest, I believe. And this probably won't apply with Spain. There's also waivers for. Um, like asylum and extreme hardship. But we should try to get you a waiver before you self-exile for those two years. <laughs> and yeah, the second question is related to the waivers. I have read that in some web pages it says months, and now it says one, one year at least. You didn't have oh. any idea of, of timing? Yeah, I, I would say like six months. Six months. Yeah. Pretty typical, but it depends on your home country and how responsive they are about actually issuing the letter that says that they don't object. Like India takes a really long time. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're Thank welcome. You. Hi. So uh, it seems that the requirements for O1A and EB1A are pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. Why would one go for O1 when you can go for EB1? Um. 
Well, sometimes it's the employer's decision. Um, sometimes they want to keep you captive for longer. So if you don't have a green card, you can be tied to them longer. Um, sometimes it's used as a stepping stone. It's a lot faster to get it. The petition can be approved in two weeks, so you could conceivably um, you know, be in that status in two weeks versus the green card could take six months. And it's also sort of a stepping stone. If you have an O1A visa already, there's uh, possibly less scrutiny with the green card later on. So is it common for startup entrepreneurs to actually go with the O1A EB1 just as a simpler mechanism, mechanism instead of just going EB1? Yeah, yeah. If you're self-petitioning and you have some other way to be here in the meantime, it's more typical to just skip ahead to the EB1A green card. Hi, my name is Sergi. Um, I have a question. So in general, I believe a lot of people are on the H1B, right? And there is also always a question like, what if I want to open like my startup and like get investments and run my own company? Uh, what is the shortest path to get the green card in this case, like from H1, like these question. investments and yeah. Yeah, so that's, that's a great question. And the reason about why it's comp why the answer is that it's complicated is because if you own any percentage of your company and you have to get an EB2 green card for a master's degree or an EB3 green card for a bachelor's degree, the perm process is extraordinarily difficult if you own your company because the whole point is the employer is making this good faith effort to find a qualified American. So if the Department of Labor sees that you have an ownership interest in the company, they're like, we don't believe that you're really trying to find somebody to replace you. So it's really hard. So um, I would say it depends on your strategy for your company and what accomplishments you might be able to rack up along the way through it over the next several years. Um, I clients in that situation who I've advised to consider the EB2 with the National Interest Waiver to avoid the perm or um, to try to you know, get some awards and publications and be on some juries to get an EB1A or um, to, to consider going abroad for a year and starting a subsidiary. Okay, and uh, sorry, if I, I want to ask a second question. So, uh, like, it's this process of perm, right? And, like, I was asking, like, okay, what, well, you're trying to find technically the person among U.S. citizens who will do job instead of me, right? And what will happen if you find them? Uh, you have to offer them a job. Yes. Or you have to stop the process and okay. restart it later. So they can stop the process, right? I mean, yeah. Because, because I know that if there, is, there was intention for immigration, the person who, like, let's say, was trying to win the lottery from, for green card, but for some reason he didn't obtain it, uh, he will never get non-immigrant visa anymore, like in the future. So it's like, if Perm will shut down, like, for some reason. Oh, no, no. no. If, you, if you withdraw a Perm, it does not bar you from getting another type of green card in the future. And totally no fine. problems with no, H1B. No. Yeah. Separate. Because that's all in the Department of Labor. I didn't even mention that. There's other agencies involved. That's like Department of Labor over there that's separate from okay. USCIS. OK, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Avinash. Uh, I want to ask about EB-5 direct equity. Uh, how much uh, percentage is a minimum that you expect it to own if you are direct, uh, you know, mm, If you're a direct investor? Equity. Yeah. You have to be, uh, okay, there's, there's no percentage, mm -hmm. but you need to have a job within the company where you are running the day-to-day -day operations and making management decisions or executive decisions about the purpose of the, the direction of the company. Okay. And second question is, uh, I'm familiar with the regional center models mm -hmm. and all that. So can you set up a, a private equity model 
uh, bypassing with the same principles as a regional center, except that I know that indirect jobs won't be counted. So can you r replicate the model and invest in the startups and things like that? Very interesting. I think the answer is yes. Talking to several people about starting regional centers. And there's a lot of types of projects that would qualify. And so if a startup is the job creating entity that the money is ultimately landing in, I think that has the potential to work. It's an exciting right. idea. OK, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Um, hi, my name is Natalie. Um, I'd like to ask about, uh, uh, actually, to follow up that gentleman's question. So in any application process with the visa, and I got declined, would that um, diminish my chance to get exactly the same type of visa in the future? For mm. example, um, let's say I want to go for the extraordinary visa and for, to get the green card, and I want to keep attempting if mm. I got declined. Would, that, uh, would I have to wait for a certain period of time until I can apply again? So there's no minimum time limit that you would have to wait. But I would say that you, would, you should wait until you have substantially different evidence so that you can say, like, look, it's totally different from before when I got denied. Now I have X, Y, Z, okay. just to make a strong argument. Understood. Um, my second question is about the E2 visa. Uh -huh. um, you mentioned, like, most of the cases you will have to at least invest, like, $100,000. Um, I'm wondering if, and you also mentioned, if I go through the E2 visa and then I have a company, then I can actually get my friend, employ, employ my friend from my home country as well. So is that a chance that I can gather funds from two or three friends and then enable me to have the E2 visa and then I recruit them into my company so that I can, you know, gather all the funds to be eligible? I like the way you think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if they give you the money, um... It could work. It could work. Okay. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I have like one last question <laughs> about the L1 visa. Because um, you mentioned if I set up a company abroad, does it have to be in my home country or is it, it can be? No, in it could be in any country. OK, yeah. understood. And after I work in that company for one year, I can transfer internally to a US affiliate or subsidiaries. Yes. But is there any requirement with that company in my home country, let's say? Because it sounds too easy. What about like there's no employee or it's just me or it doesn't even have like a commercial address? OK, it needs to be um, a legally formed business in mm -hmm. that country. Yeah. You need to be on payroll. You need to be doing a job. It needs to be a managerial or executive job. Mm -hmm. And you need to be doing some sort of business. Like, OK. So as long as that is proof of revenue, proof of business operation, yeah. and proof of salary to myself. Yeah. What about um, the subsidiary in the US? So it has to have business as well, right? Right. OK, understood. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Hassan, and I'm a an F1 student visa. Hi. And so first question is, uh, uh, in your experience, what's the most common way someone on F1 visa uh, starts their own startup and have like the papers and? Uh, F1, OK. Well, you're not allowed to work on F1. Okay. You can start a company. You can own it. You can't work there. So once you, you, once you graduate, though, you can work there and get on payroll and be an employee. So, okay, so, but, but what's the most common thing that you, like, people in that position would do? Would most do? people on F1s try to get H1Bs from companies. But then they but would get the H1B from another company. Yeah, they would have to go work for that company. Okay, so, but if they wanted just from, from like, school start? Yeah, so if you're, if you're a student and you want to have a startup when you graduate, mm -hmm. you can start the ball rolling on establishing the company, um, but you're not allowed to work there until you graduate and you get OPT. And that means not have an income. Right, not have an income. OK, so that means that uh, someone on F1 visa cannot have an in any income? Right. And Unless you have CPT, curricular practical training. But if you opt for CPT, then you can't get OPT. And it's better to have three years of OPT and STEM OPT than like a couple semesters of CPT. OK, so this, that means I have to wait until the OPT. Yeah. OK, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. 
right? Hi. Uh, I've met some people here who had a temporary visa first, like J1 or E1 mm -hmm. and or H1B, and then got a green card. So my question is, does it get easier after you have a temporary visa to get a green card, or is it the same process? Um, it's it's the same process, but <coughs> it's nice because you can already be here while you're waiting. Um, and it might be easier to get a green card sponsor if you already have the visa. OK, thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So uh, let's say if I come on uh, L1B to United States, and then I'm four or five years, I got a very critical portion in my uh, company to work on important project. I have patents and all that. So, is it way to somewhere where I can file the EB-1? Uh, like, I already have EB-2 filing, and can I uh, file another EB-1 category if I'm eligible? Yes. You can have as many green card petitions at the same time as you want to spend. And can money I on. file by myself, or it has to be addressed by a company? For the EB-1A, hmm? you can self-petition. You don't have to do it through your company. Okay. Yeah. And the second question I have is, let's say I'm on L1 uh, visa and there is a startup in another country, and can I work for that startup being in US? Is it possible? Uh, let's see. You, well, for the L1, you're not allowed to work for any other employers. In the US. In the US, yeah, that's interesting. Um, that's complicated. I don't know. I would have to think about it. My instinct is to be very conservative and say, no, that's alternative employment. That's not authorized. Um, certainly, if you took trips to that other country to do the work there, mm -hmm. that would be fine. But I'm not sure. So. If you'd like to email me, I can research that for you. OK, sure. Yeah, yeah. thank you. You're welcome. Are there any visas which are conflicting? Like you can't have one application in process while the other one is in process? So for example, uh, CPT and OPT, right? Yeah, those are, those are diametric opposites. Okay. Um, so I think the answer is no, but you bring up a very important concept that I would like to mention, which is immigrant versus non-immigrant intent, which is a really crucial distinction. Um, so if you have immigrant intent, it means you want to live here forever. And that's what you have when you become a permanent resident. Um, if you're coming on an O or an E, uh, you have to have non-immigrant intent. Those are non-immigrant visa categories that where you're not supposed to plan to stay, to live here for the rest of your life when you get it. But if you have an H or an L, those are dual intent categories. And so it's OK to either have immigrant intent or non-immigrant intent. So that's why if you're on an H-1B and your employer's sponsoring you for a green card, you go in and out, you go home for the holidays or whatever, you don't have a problem when you come back in because in, it's a dual intent status. Did I hear you right when you said O is non-immigrant? Yes, O is non-immigrant. So here's an example of how that plays out. Um, if you're here on an O, and you have an approved EB-1A petition, and you leave for a trip, and you come back, you could have problems getting back into the country. Because they'll say, we see in our system that you have this green card petition that's approved, and you're supposed to be coming here as a non-immigrant, and we don't believe that you are coming here as a non-immigrant. Um, so then it's your job to either explain, uh, well, this wouldn't work for a self-petition, but if it were an employment-based petition, you could say, well, you know, that's something that my employer filed for me. 
I don't know what's going to happen with it. You know, I still maintain my residence in whatever country. Please just let me in for my short-term trip. And they could decide to do that or not. Um, if you filed your own self-petition, it's harder to say that, you know, I had no idea that was happening. <laughs> um, but there's also uh, this other concept that comes up a lot in marriage-based cases, which is if you come here as a tourist and you get married or file a marriage-based green card within the first 60 days, the US government presumes that you had immigrant intent when you came here in a tourist status, and you could get into big trouble with that for committing fraud. Um, but if you wait more months than that, the presumption flips, and it's presumed that you had non-immigrant intent at the time of entry, and that your plans later developed. You changed your mind, circumstances changed, and then you decide to have immigrant intent later. Yeah, it's very nuanced. So, um Regarding the J-1A, there's training and internship. Are there uh, any expectations related to compensation? There are some rules and laws about internship. And so um, on. What are we supposed to comply with for yeah, those? So for the J-1, I think you're allowed, if you're this, the employer, I think you're allowed to just like give them a stipend. It doesn't have to be a living wage. It doesn't even have to be minimum wage, I think. Mm. Um, I think there's a lot of flexibility with and that. And you have to go through that. Ex there are some external companies that administer yeah. for you. Yeah. So you contract so with them to. To have, for a company to have a cultural exchange program that offers J1 status to interns and trainees, okay. they have to be authorized by the State Department. Okay. It's a huge process. You need to have, you know, to show that this is like part of your core mission to create exchange programs. It's way too much for a little company to take on. So there are cultural exchange companies that do this, and okay. the actual employer contracts with them, and they administer the paperwork. And they also take care of like the trip to the baseball stadium to learn about American culture and, yeah. and English classes and other stuff like that. Right. Thanks. Yeah, you're welcome. So as a F1 student, uh, I understand that you're not allowed to work, but uh, can you do prototyping or for your business model, or can you uh, set up a website to prototype? Or Because I heard that uh, if you're F1 student, there's still some things you can do. Um, yeah. So could you explain that? Um, It, it's it's probably okay, but it could create trouble for you later. <laughs> I don't know. Okay. Yeah. So for E2 uh, visa, so the investment, uh, the substantial investment, whatever that amount is, can uh, it has to be done at a single time, or it can be done phase, in phases? Like maybe I'm investing right now, and then I'm one year on OPT, and I invest a hundred thousand over a full year. Mm -hmm. And I show them that I have invested 100000 over one year, or it has to be a one-time investment? Um, yes. So wait, just back to the prototyping thing. I mean, the whole thing is, are you employed? So do you expect future gain from this? If you're just um, like volunteering or... Just testing a model, you know? Yeah. I, I think it's probably OK, but... Don't be employed. <laughs> I know that's so vague. Right. OK. E2. I mean, there's, there's no business model uh, at that time. When we we're prototyping, yeah. there's no business at all. Well, students are allowed to invent things and do projects and yeah. have school projects mm -hmm. and have internships. So yeah. Um, OK, E2 investment. It can, be, it can be over time. It can be separated into different chunks. Okay. It's best if you've completed the investment by the time you're hoping to get the E2 visa. Um, uh, but even then, if you're investing in somebody else's company, you could just put all the cash into an escrow account, which gets turned over to the company if the visa is approved. 
Okay. Uh, just one last thing. So when you were explaining uh, H-1B visa, you mentioned that there was a program and that you knew somebody and you could avoid mm -hmm. the lottery system with that. Could you explain that again? I yeah, missed that yeah. point. So if you're qualified to be an, a mentor, if you're an entrepreneur who can provide mentorship to students, then perhaps a university would like to give you a job doing that for their students. And that would be a part-time job. And while you're doing that job, that gives you an H-1B that is not subject to the lottery. And then your own, you can do a second concurrent H-1B through your own startup that isn't subject to the lottery. So you can spend the rest of your time working on your startup. OK. Can H-4 work, H4 work on this particular uh, university-led program for mentoring the entrepreneurs? To be on yeah, time. if you have a startup, then this university program would sponsor you for an H-1B. So you would no longer be in H-4 status. You would change status to H-1B. Uh, so in that case, we will have to apply to a university to do a program? Yeah, you, you apply through this global entrepreneur in residence program for a job at a university to do this. And my second question is uh, for a spouse having green card or applied for green card, uh, H-4 EAD means only employment, or we can also start up a business with that? It means employment, which includes the ability to start your own business on that. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Ines. Uh, I'm currently on F-2. I'm a dependent of an F-1 holder. Uh, I wanted to ask you, what is the most common, or what are my best chances to get to legal employment? Because currently, I can only volunteer. I cannot work. Mm -hmm. It's so limiting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, well, it depends on what you want to do. If you have a college degree, you could try to go into the H-1B lottery, but that's hard because you have to find an employer who's willing to sponsor you. Um, you can continue to go to school and become an F1 yourself to rack up more degrees and credentials and have the possibility of OPT at the end of it. Um, but it's, it's hard. But I'd be happy to sit down with you and talk to you about your background and education and credentials, and maybe we can brainstorm something. OK, sure. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. If we have a family business back in home country, is it possible to start up here something? Yes, absolutely. Shouldn't be a problem? What? Shouldn't be a problem? A yeah, why not? You just... uh, but, but a company with some other name doing some other business? Um, well, you don't have to have the same product in the foreign company and the US company. You just have to show that it's somehow beneficial for the company in the other country to have a US operation doing whatever. So if the benefit is that it's going to create profits, then I think we could try to make that argument. OK. Yeah. And what, what visa option would that be? This is for the L1A. Can, can it be done with E2? For the E2? Yeah. Can you have a, a country, a companies at uh, more than more, uh, one country at the same time only two? Like in yeah, USA? yeah, there's no limitation that says that you can't do that. Okay. But the, the benefit that the E2 provides is that you don't have to be connected to a foreign company. OK. OK, any more questions? Right, maybe we have time for maybe one or two uh, quick ones. Uh, hi. What hi. would be easier for my company to apply for a visa for me, an H H-1B or a TN visa? Uh, I'm from Mexico, so... Yeah, TN. TN. Don't waste your time with an H-1B. You'd have to wait until next April. You wouldn't be able to start until the following October. With a TN, it's like you just go to Mexico, you show the application at the airport, and you come in as a TN. Is there any advantage of the TN over the H-1B? Yeah, well, you get it much faster. There's no lottery, uh, and there's no six-year time limit. You can keep renewing it as long as the job opportunity is available. OK, thanks. OK, uh, well, let's hear it for Sophie. OK, thank you. So, uh, 
uh, well, thanks, Sophie, for coming. I'm going to give her an idea that Ooh, I feel comfortable with. Oh, so thank you, Rob. Stay up late at night <laughs> working on <Yay>. your visas. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Sophie will stick around for uh, individual questions. Uh, video will be ready in a few weeks. Right, Tim? All right. So thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Hi.